Hello, and thank you for joining us for this presentation called Grief and Loss, Managing the Holidays During COVID-19. My name is Kim Hangrass, and I am joined by Katie Hatch. We are both family counselors that work for the Alberta Health Services Grief Support Program located in Calgary, Alberta, Canada. Joining us is Doug Morley, one of our volunteers that help us with our program. Our program relies on our volunteers to bring their lived experience to the concepts that we discuss. And we look forward to Doug sharing those voices as he represents all of our volunteers today. In our grief counseling practice at the Grief Support Program, we provide information like we are presenting today as we know it can help people who are feeling distress with their loss. We are going to share with you tips and stories on how to manage what can be a difficult time of year for many people that are grieving the loss of a loved one. We recognize that this year in particular might bring even more layers of complexity as many of you have experienced your loss during this pandemic. We also know it can be more difficult to access support while people are in isolation or not connected to their social supports. Before we begin, we want to go over some housekeeping items. As we go through this material, it might stir up some grief reactions that you might not expect. This is normal, so don't be surprised at how you're feeling. You might feel tired or drained after what we share today, but we also hope you come away with some hope and guidance in your grief. If you came to the center, we'd be able to assess how you're doing, but because we cannot do that today, please be mindful of how you're feeling. This presentation will take about 40 minutes. So we encourage you to take a break at any time, pause this presentation, walk around, get some water and take some deep breaths. This presentation is the second webinar that Katie and I have presented. If you have not watched the first one called Grief and Loss During a Pandemic, we encourage you to do so as it will present some foundational grief concepts related to grieving during this time of COVID-19. If you research online grief support program, Calgary Zone, on our homepage, you will find a tab called support videos. And under this tab, you will find the link to our first presentation we created in May of 2020. If you are in distress right now, or would prefer to talk to someone right away, call the distress center immediately or your local crisis line where you are located. We'd also recommend that you write down the Distress Center number now in case you need it at any time during this presentation. Today's discussion will involve covering what is grief, along with specific considerations of which to be mindful while grieving during the holidays, and specifically on how that might look during the time of COVID-19. We are pleased to have Doug join us today as he will be reading his story, along with four other stories of some of our volunteers and what has helped them in their respective traditions and cultures. Thank you, Kim. I'm honored to be here to share my story along with the stories of four other volunteers that talk about how we've handled special occasions. Our stories illustrate that there's no right way to manage special occasions. We hope that our stories will encourage listeners to give themselves permission to manage special occasions in a way that works for them. In the end, you will find further resources on how to manage during this time of year. Throughout this presentation, we are going to weave in lessons from researchers, volunteers, and clients knowledgeable in the field. In this presentation, we strive to honor all spirituality, traditions, beliefs, and rituals of those watching this video. Every grief story and griever is unique and not open to comparison, regardless of faith background. Only you had your relationship with your loved one. We invite you to consider these stories shared and how they might relate to your own ways of being and practicing your own traditions. Please be aware that our volunteer stories are just that and pertain to their personal experience. Also, you know what best will help you and what will not. Throughout all the tools and examples we are providing, please trust yourself to know what to take in and what to discard. First of all, what do we know about grief? Grief is our response to the loss of anything that we value. For example, grief could have been experienced as we moved away from our childhood home, 
when the adaptations due to aging take hold, and for this video, when we face the death of someone dear to us. It is a normal and natural response to loss. Part of being human is to experience changes and transitions throughout our lives. Even happy events, such as marriage, graduation, and retirement can include elements of sadness as we leave things and people behind. Grief itself is not a linear process with predictable stages, but rather a spiral or coil of different themes that may occur more than once. Remember, everyone grieves differently. It is our expression of that loss and not an illness, though we often hear how it can feel like one. Other people might erroneously refer to you as being sick with grief and hoping that you will heal from your loss. This might lead you to think grief is an illness, but actually your response to grief is automatic and necessary. It is a personal and unique process for each person. Don't let anyone else tell you how to feel. Only you had that relationship with the person who died. Your journey in the processing of your grief is your own and as individual as your fingerprints. Thus, your experience with grief is not open to comparison. Even if you and your sibling lost your parent, each of your relationships with that same parent is different. And finally, it is a part of life. Grief impacts our whole whole being physically, emotionally, mentally, socially, and spiritually. Feelings of guilt, anger, despair, and fear are common. This is no wonder that we can feel exhausted, overwhelmed, confused, alone, and full of questions about life's meaning. What you might experience in grief includes that it will take longer than most people think. Try to avoid the pressure that can come from others to move on or get over it. Timetables for grief are hard to predict as many factors determine how long it can take. Some of those factors can include your relationship, positive or negative, with the person who died, your previous loss history, meaning how many losses you've dealt with in your past, and what you've been taught or not taught about grieving. It will take more energy than ever imagined. Grief affects every part of your DNA and takes its toll as you struggle to incorporate the loss into your life. Therefore, it is imperative to keep an eye on your health and report any concerns to your doctor. You may experience acute upsurges of grief that occur suddenly without warning, grief bursts. Sometimes on a good day, you may feel like going out to the grocery store. Moving up and down the aisles with your grocery cart nearly full, you're feeling pretty good about your decision to venture out. But suddenly a song begins to play in the store or an aroma wafts by that reminds you of your loved one and the tears begin. You quickly leave your grocery cart and rush to your car for privacy in dealing with this overwhelming feeling of sorrow. These grief bursts are more intense and frequent in the early days, weeks, and months following your loss. Even though they are frightening and can leave you overwhelmed, they are a natural response to losing a loved one. As time goes on and more progress is made along this difficult journey, these grief bursts become less often and less intense. Old issues, feelings, and unresolved conflicts may resurface. One client mentioned that his father had died more than 20 years ago. He felt he had grieved his father well. He'd read books, followed his own path, taking what helped and disregarding what didn't, and expressed what he needed to along the way. Three years ago, when his mother died, he was concerned that this new grief journey drew him back to his previous one with his father. 
he really thought all of those feelings about his dad had been dealt with. However, with the passage of time and changes in circumstances, he knew more grief work needed to be done. When we consider grief and the holidays, we realize that when a loved one dies, special occasions and holiday rituals at times such as Christmas, Hanukkah, or Eid are profoundly affected. Noticing that empty seat at the supper table can cause intense pain. Memories of holidays in the past with your loved one can bring overwhelming emotion. Perhaps the thoughts and memories, good or bad, can be daunting and cause you to want to withdraw. Sometimes you'd rather time just stopped or even reversed to better times before the person died. It is normal for people to realize that things cannot stay the same as they were when their loved one was still present. Holidays can often be difficult for those who are grieving, particularly in the first few years. You can be faced with uncertainty as to how to celebrate, participate, or even get through these important dates. Enduring becomes the daily goal for many grievers. Adding holidays and all they entail on top of that goal can become a monumental task. It becomes even more important to look after yourself and your needs in order to cope with whatever comes along. The lead up to the date can often feel worse than the day itself. Many of our clients have found that their dread of the important date is much more exhausting than the actual date itself. Therefore, it's important to wait and see how you feel once the day arrives. If at all possible, saving decisions on what to do on that occasion until the day of the occasion can be very helpful. Significant occasions can be draining, so it is important for you to tune into your own needs. It is vital to find ways to look after yourself during this time. With the possible demands by others and your own desires to make the holidays special for the people close to you, your energy tank might be quite low. By finding ways to care for your own needs, that tank is replenished. We will be going into more detail on how to care for yourself later in the presentation. Even if others don't seem to understand, this doesn't mean that you are wrong to change plans or traditions. When you are experiencing something that is so intensely painful, it's imperative to exercise healthy boundaries, especially around the demands of others. Remember, the word no is a complete sentence. By determining what your needs are, it becomes easier to ask others to respect your choices. Remember to let them know that you are doing what's best for you. Your emotions at the holidays are likely to be even more unpredictable due to added pressures and expectations. Facing the demands, invitations, and even the well wishes of others can all come with drains on energy and overwhelming emotions. Finding comfort in these challenging times can be difficult. Clients have shared with us that surrounding themselves with people who get it, those who can be present for the tears and can let the griever be who they are is imperative. There is no need to buy into the myth that some holidays are just one big happy day after another, but it's okay to have some joy and laughter. Be sure to listen to yourself and do what helps the most in the moment. Grievers have an innate wisdom in knowing what will help them personally and what doesn't. We encourage all of our clients to listen to and trust that wisdom for themselves. Loosening restrictions on what feels expected and allowing yourself to notice moments of joy and peace without guilt are ways to look after your needs. Living through the holidays after a loss can be difficult at any time, and we recognize that this year in particular during COVID-19 could bring added challenges. 
you might not be able to participate in your usual family routines, traditions, and gatherings due to physical distancing and limitations in place where you live. The holidays are times when many gather with family and not being able to do so is a stark reminder of how our usual ways of mourning are limited at this time. You might not want to participate in your usual traditions, even if it is possible with COVID safety protocols. Many of our clients have the desire to isolate early on after a loss, and so the usual holiday expectations and pressures might not be there this year, which might bring some relief. However, your family and friends might expect you to participate in the same traditions as always, not recognizing the depth of your pain. Our message today, if you walk away with just one idea, is that you need to do what is best for you, grieving in your own way and in your own time. And finally, the pandemic mixed with the holiday season is new for everyone in the world today, so be gentle with yourself. We are all learning how best to navigate this time. Now we will hear from Doug, who will start by sharing his own strategies around managing the holidays. The first story is about how I deal with special occasions after losing my wife, Val. Several years after Val passed, I decided to create traditions to celebrate special occasions, her birthday, the day she passed, our anniversary, and the holidays. Short vacations in Las Vegas were a great break from running our business. So on Val's birthday, I go to a casino and put a few bucks in a slot machine to remember the good times in Vegas. The first six years didn't produce any wins, but last year I doubled my money in three spins and I could hear Val telling me, cash in now and get out of there. On the day she passed, I go for a long walk. On the walk, I think about our 32 years together starting the day we met on the steps of an apartment building. Every year, I remember things I haven't thought about in years. When I finish my walks, I feel grateful for all the things that Val has brought to my life. The Chateau at Lake Louise, Alberta was a special place for us. We spent our honeymoon at the Chateau and many ski weekends. Around our anniversary, I ask a friend who knew Val if they'd like to have lunch at the Chateau. It's a great way to remember by sharing stories with someone else who knew her. During the holidays, Val always wanted to help the less fortunate. The holidays are a difficult time for me because I've been alone since Val's passing. My tradition is to go downtown and donate to people that are homeless. At the end of the day, even though there was no family, a home-cooked turkey dinner, or presents, this tradition is a good way to practice self-care. I believe these traditions, whether they are the same each year or change over time, are a special way to stay connected with Val and to celebrate our life together. Grieving takes energy, so be realistic with your expectations and allow yourself to choose those activities that are most meaningful to you. In the following slides, we will explore expectations for yourself, for family and friends, and during COVID-19. Beginning with managing expectations for yourself, the first question to ask yourself is, what do I need at this time? Acknowledge that the special occasion holiday might be different and or difficult. There is no right or wrong way to manage the holidays. There is only your way. And that means discerning what you can or can't handle and when you choose to engage or disengage. Make the decisions about what you believe you can manage on that day. It's a good idea to plan, have backup plans, and be flexible as you won't know how you feel or what you might be up to doing until the day of. Having several alternatives for those special days can make things easier once the day arrives. For instance, some clients have come up with three possible scenarios of what might be doable for that day. These have included going for a walk with a friend, attending a small gathering, or spending time at home doing some special activities to capture memories of the person they lost. Be sure to inform those involved 
let them know your current plans and also that those plans might change. Sometimes it's helpful to explain to those closest to us that our abilities vary day by day. By letting them know that you hope to be able to answer their invitation on the specific day, they will hopefully realize that you are looking after yourself in a way that is most helpful for you. Give yourself permission to cut back on holiday preparations. Should you decide to attend a gathering, know that you can leave at any time. Though you may have traditionally loved the holidays and have taken on preparations that you have enjoyed, this year will be different. You and only you can decide how much or how little you are willing to do. If some of the holiday events include being with others, know that how much time you spend with them is totally up to you. It can be helpful to have a preloaded excuse at the ready for when you feel it's time to leave. Do what you need to honor and acknowledge your loved one and how you are feeling. But sometimes, no matter how much you plan, you still might encounter unexpected triggers throughout your daily life. This slide found in whatsyourgrief.com, a grief resource located at the end of this presentation, represents one such scenario on different ways you might manage these expectations that unexpectedly happen to you. The scenario plays out like this. While out holiday shopping, you stumble upon a gift your loved one would have adored. What do you do? Suggestions are, let your motion wash over you. There's no shame in crying, and realistically, the tears will probably only last a minute or two. Pause for a moment of reflection, take a deep breath, and move on with your shopping. Snap a picture of this and share it with others who might get it. Buy the gift and donate it in your loved one's name. Buy the gift and give it to a friend or family member who might appreciate it, or buy the gift and keep it for yourself. The takeaway here is that there are different responses that can result, and there is no right or wrong in any of these strategies. In our second story, Belginder talks about using a cultural tradition to remember her brother, Ranjit. Bell found that one of the most meaningful ways to connect with Ranjit and to honor his memory was through an annual tradition called Rukri. During this tradition, sisters tie a bracelet on their brothers as a way to symbolize the sibling relationship. The story behind Rukri is that the longer the bracelet stays on, the stronger the bond. Since Ranjit's passing, Belle and her older brother have changed the tradition and now tie one on each other's wrists as a way to honor Ranjit. Belle last tied a Rukri on Ranjit's wrist a few days after his death as the tradition sadly fell on a date following his accident. Since 2013, she and her older brother have continued their new tradition and Belle still has that first Rukri from 2013 on her wrist. It is a reminder to her that Ranjit is close by and there is continued strength in their bond. Her new ritual was created out of need, purpose, and a want for continuity. It was an opportunity to share Ranjit's life and memory with others and to honor the closeness Belle and her brothers shared in life. Belle ties a bracelet on a rock every year where Ranjit's accident occurred and her son and daughter also participate in the tradition by tying a bracelet on each other's wrists. Their new tradition represents an opportunity to connect in new ways with not only each other, but as a bridge to connect them all to Ranjit. To others, it may seem like Belle has an old thread on her wrist, but to her, it represents protection, closeness, and safety in knowing that Ranjit is watching over her and her family. This time of year can be especially difficult with the holidays. It is important to honor what works for you during this time. Make yourselves a priority and create opportunity and meaning through your own traditions, whether they be existing ones, new, or even completely made up. After managing expectations for yourself, 
We now want to discuss how to manage the expectations of family and friends. The following two patterns of grieving are by Ken Doka, a renowned grief specialist and researcher. They help illuminate that there is more than one way to grieve. In managing the family and friends, you'll notice on the left side is the feeling style. This is where grief is experienced emotionally. The griever is filled with intense feelings and has waves of emotions. These can include anger, fear, guilt, and sadness. Grief is expressed emotionally. Thus, they vent emotions in a more overt or observable way. These feelings of primarily sadness, despair, and loss precede and dominate thinking. On the right side of the chart is the thinking style. This is where grief is experienced in thinking, where the griever is trying to make sense of the loss. Feelings are limited or toned down and can be thought of as more covert or unseen. Deep in thought or keeping busy are often words attributed as to how the griever is doing. Grief is expressed cognitively and behaviorally. There is a pronounced focus on problem solving, such as taking care of the estate. Thinking and doing precedes and dominates outward feelings. Important things to note when looking at these two styles are, there are some people who can be a blend of both styles. There is no right or wrong, nor a preferred style. They are each valid. Society can put a lot of positive emphasis on the feeling style during the early days, weeks, and months of one's grief. Tears are expected as a way of showing the depth of love for the deceased. Society's positive emphasis shifts to the thinking style after the first year. One is expected to be more in control of outward emotions by this time. Thus, it's easy to see how misunderstandings can arise if we follow society's norms rather than our own personal ways of grieving. Lastly, by knowing these two styles with regard to the members of our families going through grief, we can be more understanding and less judgmental. Acknowledging that people grieve differently does away with others trying to explain away our feelings, thoughts, and behaviors. Kara's story is about the loss of her son, Thomas, and how her family handles Christmas. For Kara, holidays didn't make a difference. She missed her son, Thomas, every day and thought about him constantly. It didn't matter if it was Thanksgiving, Christmas, or a regular day. The first Christmas, her husband didn't want to decorate, even though he normally loves Christmas and goes all out. But Kara felt if they didn't decorate, they'd be setting themselves up for sadness and be consumed by grief. So they did decorate as much as usual, and it worked out fine. How they handled that first Christmas together, which was to decorate as usual, highlights that everyone must do what works for them. One Christmas, a few years after Thomas died, her daughter asked if they could go to the cemetery. Her daughter had avoided going there because it made her cry. Kara was glad that her daughter felt strong enough on that day to go to the cemetery. They took their dogs as well, and the dogs had a ball running around in the deep snow. To Kara, it felt like they were including Thomas. Even now, when decorating for Christmas, her husband gets sad at reminders of their son but these same reminders make Kara happy. They still put Thomas's stocking up. It's a sad reminder. She can't deny that they still miss him, but avoiding reminders doesn't lessen the sadness. Not putting up his stocking would feel worse. So far we've discussed how to manage expectations you may have for yourself and how to manage expectations you might feel from others. Let's explore further how managing expectations apply specifically during the time of COVID-19. Firstly, the holidays typically involve increased activities and connections. Abiding by your comfort level is paramount. Following COVID protocols in your area is crucial, but
but you might choose to limit your exposure and take an even more conservative approach. This is okay and is best for you. During the pandemic, you might have fewer activities to choose from, but you might still want and value the ritual and meaning of these activities. How can you get creative in meeting your needs for ritual and connection while keeping yourself safe and following COVID protocols? This will involve some creativity on your part around what is important to you, what was important to your loved one, and how you might practice your ritual in less of a social environment. Here are some ideas that you can consider. Firstly, be gentle with yourself. This means no judgment or criticisms of yourself while you figure out what will work. You might and probably will make mistakes along the way. This is to be expected when learning anything new and this pandemic is certainly new. Have a memory time, look through photos, think on stories, perhaps make a memory book. Consider doing something your loved one enjoyed, cooking their favorite food, visiting their favorite location. But maybe it might be more helpful instead of doing what reminds you of them to change your routine open presents at a different time, have dinner at a different hour, serve different foods. What is important is getting you through what might be a hard day, so no approach is wrong. Here are further strategies and ideas. Rituals can be comforting and help you feel connected to your loved one. COVID restrictions take away a lot of what we feel we can control. Incorporate more ritual than you might otherwise, because this you have control over. Get creative with your gatherings you might still want to have. Meet over Zoom, share photos, invite others to share their memories and stories. If they invoke laughter, all the better. And just because you made these changes this year doesn't mean they're permanent. Each year will look different and can involve returning to old traditions or creating new ones. In our next story, Shirley talks about the comfort her book of memories brings after the loss of her brother, Rick. One of the things that helps Shirley during the holiday season is her Rick book of memories that she created a year after he passed. The book is full of pictures, letters, cards, and other memorabilia dedicated to their times together. She keeps Christmas ornaments that he gave her visible year round in her curio cabinet. She tries to be kinder to herself during the season. Her best friend of almost 60 years also knew Rick well. During the holiday season, they make a dinner appointment and Shirley brings her Rick book. They remember the great times they all had together. Shirley surrounds herself with supportive family and friends who are okay with her oversharing her holiday memories of her wonderful little brother. She believes that we all choose our own individual grief pathway. She needed to give herself permission to do what worked for her. She can reach out when she needs to and is not ashamed to ask for support. Shirley truly believes strength comes from asking for help when one is in need. She is also learning to honor the memory of what was while living and functioning in the present. Last but not least is self-care. This concept has been an important thread throughout this presentation. So what do we mean by the term self-care? It is providing for you, by you. It's about identifying your own needs and taking steps to meet them. This intentionally tending to your own needs can increase your energy and strengthen your resilience. While others in your life may not understand, it is vital to discover what your needs are at this time and take steps to meet them. You have every right to feel what you're feeling and experience what you're experiencing. It's taking the time to do some of the activities that nurture you. For some, this can be a new idea. You may not realize that some of the things you do in your life can nurture your mind, body, and spirit. It's time to discern what you're already doing as well as discover new things you can do to refill your energy tank. So what can I do to help myself now? For a healthy lifestyle, it is important to remember that the mind and body are connected. 
Reduce stress and fatigue by drinking lots of water, eating healthily, breathing deeply, and getting lots of rest. Move as you are able, perhaps taking a, a daily walk. Mentally, limit your media exposure, especially later in the evening. Exercise gratitude. For instance, for people, pets, nature, and for each day, identifying the positive aspects in your life in the moment. Reach out for help if you need it and when you need it. This too is self-care. There are resources provided near the end of this presentation. Emotionally, give yourself permission to feel. Find outlets for your feelings, no matter what they are, like talking, journaling, playing music, and engaging in creative pursuits. Even exerting yourself by exercising or finding other forms of expression can go a long way in managing uncomfortably intense feelings. Social, this can require more creativity as we all need to stay safe during COVID. One idea is to connect with family and friends via telephone or video chat. Another place to start could be to think of what activities you used to find enjoyable and adapt them to the present COVID reality. Make sure to let others know what you need from them and how best to support you. Don't expect that they will know. This can go a long way in helping them help you. In our last story, Christy talks about how her family is thoughtful and deliberate in how they remember her father, Ken. The firsts, first Christmas, first Father's Day, first birthday, first anniversary, after Christy's dad died, were thoughtful and deliberate. As the different holidays came, Christy, her mom, her sister discussed exactly what they were going to do, and it became not what they wanted or needed but what they could manage for each holiday. For Christmas, their tradition was for their immediate family to get together, spend the afternoon opening gifts and have dinner at her or her sister's house. For the first Christmas after Christie's dad passed, they decided to go to her uncle's house for dinner and surround themselves with additional loving support. They were able to miss him together, but not focus on the sorrow of his absence. To honor her dad, her family, her sisters, nieces, nephews, and children wrote out their favorite dad-grandpa stories and tucked them in a stocking that hangs on the mantle each Christmas. The first Christmas, all the stories were read aloud and tears and laughter ensued, depending on what the story was. Every year since, that stocking hangs on the mantle. Stories have been added over the years and everyone individually chooses to read some or all, or none, as works best for them. Each year for her dad's birthday, her family celebrates by getting together at the Legion with his siblings, her aunts and uncles. Doing this feels like he is the guest of honor, almost giving them permission to spend the afternoon talking about him, sharing stories, reminiscing and laughing while do, doing something that he also enjoyed. The first years particularly, they found it extremely helpful to manage the holidays, anniversaries, and special occasions by accepting how they were feeling at the time and to adjust accordingly. Being open to shift traditions, create new traditions if they fit, or keep old traditions gave them permission to do what felt most comforting in that moment or time. Lastly, we want to finish with a message of hope from Rabbi Brian Kinsbrunner and the value and deep meaning in remembering. The loss of a loved one is like a candle no longer lit. There is a diminishing of light, of joy. The holiday is not the same, something is missing. Yet with the grief, we are not diminished. We can still rekindle the light. This is done through memory and reminiscing. The holidays become a time when families gather to share what is missed which can often provide joyful moments in the face of the emptiness felt. 
When we remember someone, the smell of the food cooked or the sound of their voice as the person repeats the same joke every year, we are symbolically relighting the candle that burned out. We are rekindling the fire in the room and working through our grief, which always reappears during the happier moments of life. We've compiled some holiday resources for you to explore further if you're interested in knowing more. All of these resources were written pre-COVID, so keep that in mind as you read more on managing the holidays. If you are in crisis and need help immediately, call the Distress Center. And if you're looking for more mental health supports in the Calgary area or general grief online resources for those outside of the Calgary zone, please take a look at the information on this slide. There is help available and we encourage you to access any of these resources if you need help. Thank you for taking the time to watch this presentation. Now it's time to go and take care of you. As you reflect back on what we've shared about grief, the holidays and COVID, know that it might be helpful to watch this video again. You might even suggest that others watch it to understand where you're coming from as you make decisions regarding these holiday times. We're hopeful that during this time of your grief, you have gained a few tools that could help and that you make yourself and your needs a priority. In closing, I'd like to share a quote by Helen Keller. What we once enjoyed and deeply loved, we can never lose. For all that we love deeply becomes a part of us.